we all know we need to work out to keep fit, but George Sheehan takes exercise a lot more seriously. He is a lifelong competitive runner. He believes that regular exercise is one of the keys to becoming a complete human being. He ties physical fitness in with the lessons of history's great thinkers, and he is considered the leading philosopher of the running world. George Sheehan has been delivering his message about fitness in his best-selling books for more than a decade. He joins us now to talk about his philosophy, about running, and about observations about America today. Welcome. This is a pleasure to have you mm. here. Pleasure to be here. You are what, 71 now? 71. Um, the cancer, you, you, how, how are you doing with the cancer? Uh, it's a Mexican standoff. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing fine. The cancer's doing fine. And, and it's uh, sort of a Mexican you know, standoff. You know, so I think that uh, I'm doing the actually doing quite well, and uh, I'm letting the cancer decide what it wants to do, but presently it isn't interfering in any way with my right. life. Has it changed your life? Changed my thinking. In uh, what way? Well, once you find you have cancer, you go through a, a major uh, uh, reassessment uh, about what's going on. Uh, and it's a familiar thing. I'm a cardiologist, and uh, it's a familiar sequence. that I've seen it with people with heart attacks. Yeah. Uh, the first... Uh, thing is denial. It's not my heart, it was a pizza. Right. You know, and the cancer is, a, they, they've gotten the specimens mixed up, or that we mm -hmm. want a second opinion. And so it's denial, then panic sets in, and, uh, and then finally depression, and then you come out the other side. You can't stay depressed. What follows depression? Uh, usually you, res you resume uh, your previous um, personality, um, quirk, so to speak, only it seems to be heightened. And um, for instance, an aggressive uh, coronary patient is likely to sign themselves out of uh, intensive care, just walk out. They just... Yeah, because that's the kind they, they're, they're, they tend to uh, don't want to take orders, out they go. Yeah. In my instance, I think uh, being um, introverted and solitary, I went back inside myself to uh, kind of assess my life and and see what is missing. I've only had a short period of time. Uh, what should I be doing that I wasn't doing? And I'd spent most of my life trying to be the best of whatever I was, a physician or a runner or a writer. And, uh, but it was all individual. It was all the self. And uh, I had pretty well stripped people away from my life. And I think that's the main thing that's occurred from having the cancer is that uh, it's funny because coincidentally, I had a letter from a friend. He said, I wish you'd spend some time deciding what you want to be when you grow up. <laughs> I get those letters too. Yes. And so. And I decided I want to be back in fifth grade. Because why? fifth grade, I learned more in one year than I ever had in my entire life. And you suddenly got an idea of what the game was about. You know, the whole world. You're starting to see the world. Mm -hmm. And then. You uh, remember your fifth grade teacher? I do, Sister Eleanor. Yeah, you know, Miss sure. Pearsall. Right. And, uh, and that's another thing, a theme in the book, which I didn't realize, is that need, a continuing need for Sister Eleanor and Mrs. Pearsall right. in some way. And, and then I had my gang, which I had stripped myself of. And then I was going out every uh, afternoon on these Brooklyn streets and having peak experiences, what Maslow later described as peak experiences, <laughs> but I didn't know I was having them. Yeah, and yeah. as adults, you have them about one every three months, you yeah. see. Uh, so, uh, and I realized it was the gang, so uh, I've gone back and uh, now I have a gang. We meet Saturday mornings on the boardwalk. I mean, who's in the gang? Oh, it varies from 20 to 40 people, every, all different kind of people. And uh, some days, they sh some Saturdays, some show up, others, others. And then we go over to um, Pancake House and have about a two-hour breakfast with full of laughs and a little brandy for the coffee. And, <laughs> And we go on trips together and <laughs> party together, and all of a sudden I'm back in the world. So yeah. that was a big move, and and as a matter of fact, I closed the book with with that development in my life, and a quote of a poem by Hilaire Belloc, where he said, uh, uh, "From first beginnings out to undiscovered ends, the only thing worth the winning is laughter and the love of friends." It took me the cancer to realize, took the cancer to make me realize that I was missing that part of The laughter of, of friends. Yeah. The love of friends. Laughter and the love Did of friends. Did you have the laughter? 
Well, yes, but it was a Brooklyn type of laughter that I have. I do a kind of Woody Allen stick, which is <laughs> when I do my uh, talks, you know, I'm, I'm very vulnerable. You know, I get up and, and uh, so I do that. Vulnerable uh, meaning what? You, that you... Well, that little tiny thin bone. I was put in a locker when I was a freshman in high school. You know, I, I well, like Woody Allen put George in the locker. I, Woody Allen said I attract violence. You see, you know, and I, I kind of so I I've always done that kind of loner, um, beat upon kind of person. Yeah, vulnerable. You know, you know. Yeah. Now here's what's interesting to me about you because you do think about the human condition. You think about yourself. A lot of it was focused on individual excellence, as you just said, and then you later. When you have cancer and you think about mortality, you think about how long you've got to live, and you think about what's important and all of that. I'm always concerned that it takes us, most of us, some event like that to come to these yes. important revelations. Yes. It really is extraordinary. Why should that be? I don't know. Yeah. You tell me. Because it, it, all you do, you read in the, the classics, uh, Marcus Aurelius said, uh, uh, make each day a masterpiece. Yeah. Uh, Emerson said, every day is doomsday. Yeah. I had a 28-year-old runner write to me and she said, I've discovered that today is the big event. <laughs> <laughs> and she's only 28 years old and it's taken me, I don't know, maybe uh, 70 years to find out today is, is the, the big, big event. event. Today. I, I like a great quote I have from Lewis Mumford. And he said, today might be a fair sample of eternity. Wow. And I, I do that with my audience, my unfit, overweight, <laughs> smoking audience. Today and say, may be a fair right, sample. Would you want to be this way? Are you going back to your creator with that wonderful gift that you got at birth in this condition? <laughs> do you want six weeks of spring training or something <laughs> of that sort? You say, you know. what, I know you do this kind of thing, but I haven't heard it. If you had to give a last lecture, what would you say to us? What have you learned? We've talked a little bit about it about the fifth grade and the gang mm. and all of that. But when we take a break, after we take this break, come back and tell me what it is you think you'd want to say to us if it was a last lecture. George Sheehan is here and we'll be right back. Stay with us. We're back with George Sheehan. So, philosopher, runner, mm. cardiologist, um, what would you tell us if this was the last lecture? Well, I, I doubt that I could, would be up to that. Although I remember one time I had to give a lecture at, for a race in Pittsburgh, and they had such a big crowd, I had to give it from a pulpit. <laughs> it's one of those pulpits you actually climbed up yeah, to. Yeah. And underneath, the, right underneath the, the, the pulpit edge was a black, brass plaque, and on it it had engraved, preach as if you will never preach again. Yeah. And uh, it's preach, the le and I do, I actually give a fitness lecture that has a text. It's from Irenaeus, uh, one of the ancient fathers, and I said, I tell you, this is the first fitness talk you'll ever uh, hear that's, uh, that has a text, and the text is simply, uh, the glory of God is man fully functioning. And of course that means functioning body, mind, spirit, yeah. socially. I think that the message is uh, that we lead lives inferior to ourselves. That's, that's the Jamesian message. He actually mm -hmm. said that. And we that, do. It really is. None know, of us live to our potential. Yeah, we live and, lives inferior to ourselves. And I think the other thing is we keep comparing to other people, and there's no comparison to anyone else. I am the only George Sheehan that will ever exist, and yeah. therefore the only one I can compare myself is to what is potential in me. I, I have to be the best George Sheehan. And, and that means going through, I think, Maslow's five, you know, uh, survival, security, belonging, then self-esteem, and finally self-actualization, becoming that person. And I think what I've discovered, of course, I, as a physician, I'm essentially uneducated. Uh, doctors uh, are really high school graduates. They go through uh, college they go through medical school and college. You take pre-med. It's just, just too much science and not enough. Absolutely, there's nothing. Arts. And so at 45, I started to go to the public library instead of the medical library. And at 45? At 45. Yeah. And um, well, I found these astounding people talking to me. Yeah, Emerson and Thoreau. And all the people I selected are these tremendous individualists. Ortega, Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, William James. And I think 
Now, when I look back, it's, I think that would be the advice. It's to get someone who says what you think in the words of a genius. Yeah. You know, we, and, and I even have people that tell me about my books. They say, well, you said just what I was thinking, but I couldn't say it. And so it's those kind of people. I mean, if, if you're like me, in fact, there's a, I did a little bit in the book about counselors. And counselors are multiplying like rabbits. I mean, they're, <laughs> they're outnumbering people who need to be counseled. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so, they start counseling each other. Yeah. So I say, well, if uh, I say to counselors, don't tell me what to do. Tell me what you do. Don't tell me what's good for me. Tell me what's good for you. Yeah. If I can see the me in you, then you become my leader, my friend. Um, I'll become yeah. your reader. And I think that's what we have to do. We have to find those geniuses in the past that, because there's nothing new under the sun. Right. Ecclesiastes. Right. <laughs> Our first friend in the Bible, somebody said. First one who seemed to treat you as if you were a fallen creature, <laughs> yes, you know, right. and that was normal. First one we could relate to. <laughs> right. And, and uh, find that particular person for you. Uh, I think that I would say this is what I've learned at 71. Yeah. Find the one. Go ahead. Life is a game. It's a game. And yeah. it's the big event today. And it's the big event. And yeah. I, I, it's a great Preaches as if this is your last sermon. <laughs> right. Yeah. So uh, as what Al Arbor said to the Islanders in that Pittsburgh series, I said, I want you to skate every shift for your last. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. Yeah. You know? But I think the, uh, this, uh, uh, the final thing is uh, what I see is in Blake. Because Blake's William had, Blake. Yeah, you know, William Blake. Mm -hmm. And he had, uh, in one of those little couplets kind of, he said, the child's toys and the old man's reasons are products of the two seasons. The yeah. child's toys and the, and the old, old man's, man's reasons. reasons. See, here you have age, youth, infancy, and Beginning and end. Now, the child's toys and the old man's reasons then are similar. What is, what is the old man's reason? The old man's reasons is that this was all a game. And we were out there beating each other up over the head. And everybody's a winner. And the only difference is whether you have class. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have class? And, you, and, and there are people that just rise above everybody because they have class. Yeah. Class is integrity, class is class. style, class yeah. is... Class is like Bucky Fuller. Here's a man that almost everything he did was a failure. Yeah. You know, but he exuded class. I mean, yeah. he exuded this hope and trust and yeah. life is worth living. And they said, somebody said uh, before he died, he was in his office and his, his desk was piled you know, with the stuff that he was into. Uh, I thought he was such a great guy. Yeah. Is there any, you know, he once thought about committing suicide. Oh, he once yes. told me this story about almost wanting to walk into the, uh, I think it was Lake Michigan. He was going to walk right. into Lake Michigan because he just thought, I'm no good and I don't amount to anything. And all this well, he, he went two years where you had to speak to his wife and he didn't talk to anybody. But, Is that right? Yeah. But then, you know, when I met him and he turned out he ran cross country at Harvard. Oh, now, yeah. who would know that, you know? Yeah. So he said yes. And he said, uh, uh, my coach was uh, Alfie Shrub. Now, you might not have, Alfie Shrub held the world's record at everything from the two mile to the 15 mile. He turned professional. He's a great English runner. And what, what years did he run? This would be just around the turn of the century. Right, yeah. I missed Alfred. Yeah. <laughs> so he said, Alfie used to yell at me. He said, Fuller, stop running with your hands. He said, I looked down and my fist would be clenched. He dredges this up out of 70, you know, wow. like 60 well, years before. I want to turn to some other things, but what, what regret do you have? I mean, is there a wonderful, is there a great, for example, are you really, does it ever cause you to be a little bit depressed that you didn't go to the library when you were 25 rather than when you were 45? You know? yeah. Or do you simply say, that's the way it is. I came to it late, but by God, you know, first yeah. day of the rest of my life. Uh, I've sometimes had that question thrown up to me in clinics. What would you do different? Right. That's what I'm asking. I said, if I did anything different, I wouldn't be here yeah. right now. <laughs> That's right. You know, that, that, I had to take those steps to get here. Everything. Look, you've got to, it's, you're in a labyrinth. And whether you start early or late, I, I like Joseph Campbell's idea. I was thinking, if you're in a labyrinth, how do you get out? Well, you keep turning right. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so, but what is the right turn? And, and I think Campbell's idea is the right turn. Follow your bliss. Follow your bliss. Follow your bliss. Whatever it is that attracts you, I think you always have to have a project. I've always had a project. Goals are important. 
I started a, when before I started in the running, I started a boys' school. Uh, and then I got into the running, then I got into the writing, and uh, yeah. and then after the cancer, that was another thing that happened. I, I thought to myself, I have to have a project now. I had been in the Navy at St. Albans, and it was an enormous uh, a hospital, and you were put on a ward, and you're supposed to stay there. And if you left the ward, you were suspect. So we had this code, we, you would carry papers with you when you were off the ward, like you were on some kind of <laughs> errand. Yeah. And I kept thinking, I better, I better start carrying papers. He's going to look down and say, that guy isn't doing anything, let's get rid of him, you know? <laughs> so that's what I need, I need another project. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I'm into that somewhere. Yeah. Well, you talk about goals a lot as well. It's important yeah. to have goals. George Shannon's here. We'll be back in just a moment, and we'll talk about a lot of other things uh, that are of interest to you, including running. I know that all of you who love running uh, want to hear what George has said about running and what he believes about running and the philosophy of running, and we'll do that when we continue. We are back with Dr. George Sheehan. Uh, a lot of what you said is reflected in the running. Um, but what does running bring you? It brings you physical well-being and what else? Well, I think my life depends on running. Uh, now, I don't mean other people need. I, I need to do that. I think I, I look on running as a brand of exercise that provides um, numerous benefits to me. But other people do it in a variety right. of ways, walking or cycling or swimming, whatever. Bicycling. Uh, yes, but I see, uh, see, I see this global effect of running. It, it re the people that are into the fitness um, phenomenon uh, are, are from a multiplicity of disciplines. You know, they're physiologists and physicians and psychologists and sociologists. Everybody has a pronouncement about it. But they all have their little turf. See, yes. I mean, the physician, all he, he looks at me and all he sees is, a, is a, bl a lipid level, you know, what's <laughs> right. your cholesterol, you know? <laughs> and the physiologist looks at me and wants to what my VO max and my treadmill test, and yeah. the psychologist has this profile of mood states and all that sort yeah. of thing. And, and what I see is this global thing, and it reminds me, um, there was an essay D.H. Lawrence once wrote, uh, Defending the Novel. I have about, two, I have a, must have a thousand books and two novels. Uh, I think the novel is indefensible. I'm too busy living my own novel, you know, uh, to bother with anybody else. And somebody's going up in the garret and think of, dream up this thing. So, uh, but no, D.H. Lawrence said it was a supreme work of art uh, because he said only in, in the novel do you see man, total, living, human, alive. He said the novel is the bright book of life. And I, I think of, uh, of running as the bright book of life because Lawrence said every other artist only sees bits of man, doesn't see this total thing. I run because I'm going to live longer, certainly. Yeah. Uh, my cholesterol down, my blood pressure, and so I'm healthy. I run because I increase the length of my day, what I call my life expectancy. Yeah. I doubled it I went because the beginning, the end of my work becomes the beginning of my day. So I get that additional eight hours. I run, the end of your work? Yeah, the end so of you my working as, day. Yeah, then, see, there's a, there was a great book by Arnold Bennett back around 1910. I've just gotten about to 1910. <laughs> I've yeah, well, moved up from there. Time, yeah. yeah, and it was called How to Live on 24 <laughs> Hours a Day. Yeah. That's the budget. <laughs> so, and you got eight hours to sleep. Now you've got 16 hours to uh, work out your professional success, right. your domestic bliss, and the salvation of your soul. Right. So most of America is in a semi coma at seven <laughs> o'clock at night, you know? I mean, where, where, you want to get your 20, you want to get this 16 hours of happy, healthy activity. Yeah. That's what fitness is. Yeah, but most of America, that's interesting because most of America wakes up at six, seven, you know, and, yeah. and they're then spinning out towards work yeah. and they come home at seven o'clock, and as you say, they're, they're collapsed. Yeah. I mean, they haven't figured out how to spend. And if that, if you, if you take 12 hours uh, and out of the 24, what they do with the next 12, so then they have another 12, that, uh, eight, let's say they sleep eight, that gives 20, they only have four hours to play with, and, and I don't think they do very well with that four hours. No, and see, that's what Bennett was concerned. In, in 1910 London, people were fit. Yeah. But in 1910 London they were? Yeah. From what? Walking, tennis, they were very active. People, people were fit in the... In, in, they didn't uh, have all the creature comforts. Years. That's right. We're the fittest country now with automobiles, I think. 
of all those that have automobiles, we're <laughs> yeah, the right, fittest. Yeah. But what, more what, so than the Swedes? Well, I don't think they... Uh, there's still, I think, a lot of bicycling there, I think, yeah. or whatever. <laughs> but what is it about, uh, about uh, Bennett was that he felt that the Londoners were frittering away their leisure time and their minds were going to lard, not their body. Yeah. So he wanted 45 minutes three times a week for their minds and yes. get them interested. Pick anything. You don't have to, uh, don't pretend you're interested in classical music if right. you're not, right. but find something that fascinates yeah. you. I, you know, I, I, I absolutely agree with that because I constantly say to people about a, a broadcast about life, find your passion and pursue it. Right. Regardless follow of what your it bliss. Is. Follow your bliss, exactly. Mm -hmm. Let's give credit to right. Joseph Campbell. <laughs> right. Follow your bliss. Turn right and then follow your bliss. Mm -hmm. But it is true. Is it, it Follow your passion, those things that turn you on because yeah. those are the things that will call on your own capacity for excellence. Absolutely, and I think one of the things that we do wrong is that we try to build up our weaknesses. Forget yeah. about your weaknesses. Right. Go from your strengths. Exactly. If you've got Every a, good coach you've got that, a fastball without a exactly. hop on it, don't throw <laughs> that dinky right. curveball. Right. Right. You know? right. <laughs> yeah, so I yeah. think that's what we should see. What is our? What are our strengths? L know your know thyself is right. purely it. Now, if you're a loner. Uh, as I am, you've got to work from that. Well, is that a, I mean, is that one thing I hear from you, though? Look, I, I was by instinct, by definition, self-definition, a loner. I mean, the individual pursuit of excellence was who I was, and I understood that. But are you saying now that was a mistake? Um, no, I'm not really say, saying that. You're just saying I'm not I came saying that was a mistake. I think that what I did, I was made. I'm an intellectual. Right. Now that doesn't mean I'm intelligent. It has nothing to do with intelligence. What does it have to do with it? Most intellectuals need somebody around to have, make sure they have their driver's license and <laughs> they've got their yeah. plane tickets yeah, and all that. Right. It means that you're interested in ideas. And Ortega, another one of my, my mentors, uh, once said he never thought he'd meet a person as interesting as an idea. See, that, that is a pure intellectual. Yeah, that's an interesting but idea. There are, that is, there's that a I spectrum yeah. you know, where but see, if I was going on a trip, I'd much rather bring Emerson than talk to the guy next to me in the plane. You really had. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk more about that when we George Sheehan is here. We'll take another break and then we'll come back and we'll talk more. Welcome back. George Sheehan is here. Let me talk a little bit about fitness, in a sense, from from your perspective as a cardiologist. Um, why is it that we have most of us? See, I don't, I'm not a runner, but I play. I'm active and I mm -hmm. work out and I play basketball. I don't run because I find it boring. I know you've heard this before, but just bear with me. I know this is, doesn't speak well of me, so I understand all of that. But I like to play basketball, I mean, I, I, anything, but it's got to be a game. Mm -hmm. I don't want to run. I don't like to run. I love walking in the woods and, and I love solitude. I know this is, help me, doctor. Mm -hmm. Explain to me where, where did I go wrong. No, yeah, that's perfectly all right. I, have, I start out my talk saying running is boring because most <laughs> of the people in the audience have already discovered that. Yes. They, and, and runners are even more boring, which, which is yes, certainly, that's right. I mean, that's a universal uh, you mean, you, apprehension you mean, of a human condition. <laughs> running is boring and the people who run are boring? Oh, yeah. They, well, they're, if they're not holy in that, they're, they're healthy in they're that. They have a kind of biological arrogance. They look at people wondering when they're going to die. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Or, <laughs> or also they look at people and say, I'm superior. Oh, yes. Yeah. And yeah. my resting pulse is 40. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I, I know the whole gambit. So, so it's, it's, it's simply a matter. Oh, yeah. I said if Rodan ever came down to do Modern Man, he'd have his finger on his carotid, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Which is totally unnecessary. That's the other thing, is that uh, fit, you could put fitness on a cue card. You know? <laughs> is that right? You know, it's so simple. Uh, it's, you mean, you, you know, take a card, this is not right, a cue card, but fitness, you take a card and say fitness. Fitness, 30 minutes. 30 minutes. 30 minutes, not miles laps or anything. 30 else. minutes. 30 minutes. How uh, comfortable pace, no target rates, forget your pulse, everything mm -hmm. else. Four 30 times minutes, a week. comfortable pace, four times. And, and what would that do for me? That would make you fit. That would, that would give you that 16 hours of happy, healthy, productive activity. 30 minutes. Comfortable four, pace. Comfortable pace. Four, four times a week. Four times you a week. your body to comfortable. Now, the only question then is, what do I do? Yes. Yeah, so then that's where the key is, because the major thing about fitness programs is usually the phys ed you hated when you're in school. So it won't work. It has to be play. It has to be fun. It has to be something that is at least not abhorrent to you. 
to. The muscles don't care what they're doing yeah. as long as they're moving. We care because certain But the muscles must hate people who are sedentary, don't they? Oh, yeah. The muscles should have an 800 number they could call. <laughs> it's like, come get me, this guy. <laughs> this guy doesn't care about me. No, I need help. Yeah, yeah, come need use help. me. Come use me. Right. And I have Abuse this, me. And I, and I don't think people, and physicians don't either, understand this, is that your lungs are as good as they'll ever be. Yeah. You've got a reasonably good heart. You've got a lousy body. That's the whole, the whole problem with people is they have lousy bodies. They yeah. have great lungs and fairly good hearts, but lousy bodies. Yeah. So it's simply a matter of 30 minutes yeah. at a comfortable pace, four times a week, finding something, the thing you want to do after school, as you want to play games. Right. Now, so racket sports, right. uh, golf, um, basketball is fine. Yeah. Our, our kids all, as a matter of fact, they're having their playoffs in their basketball league uh, come Thursday. And uh, they're all in their 30s. Yeah, and, they, and they love it. Oh, they love right. it. Yeah. Take a look at this uh, intern. This is this is. I want you to look at this. Is Hank Gathers? You know the story yes. of Hank Gathers. Mm -hmm. It's just. It, it says something about there's no justice in the world. It says something about uh, here's a young man who everybody adored. I mean, they say that if you thought he was a good basketball player, he was a better human being. Mm -hmm. Is what they say about him. I mean, it just. It's like uh, there was that book that Kushner wrote that. Uh, why do Why do bad things happen to good, good people? Or something like that. Ta roll tape, and we'll take a look at this. Hank gathers there, and uh, here is a young man who looks like he is in—you couldn't be in better shape. Uh, he had a heart murmur, I guess. Is that what he had? Mm -hmm. yeah. He Explain had a, he had he a had. rhythm, uh, an arrhythmia, yeah. which he had experienced uh, last year. He'd gone through extensive tests, uh, including, I think, electrophysiological testing, yeah. where they try to precipitate an arrhythmia and then discover the drug that will block it. Yeah. He was put on that. Of course, you've got to see the doctor's position. Here's a young man in, in, who is uh, uh, one of the best at what he does. He's uh, got He'd millions in his future, right. and I'm going to tell him he can't do it. Yeah. Plus, it's something he loves to do. But did a doctor tell him he couldn't do it? No, I mean, here's the alternative. Yeah, you right, say, right, right. It's always easier to say, no. Doctors are saying no to everybody. Don't do this. Don't, don't do, do that. that. Don't, don't that. do that. Now, sports cardiology is a relatively new field, um, uh, and uh, there are people who uh, uh, maybe have a great deal more experience in this uh, than others. So the ordinary cardiologist, I wouldn't say, would be the person that would make this kind of decision. Now, I don't know who it was that took care of him yeah. out in L.A., but... Uh, this, uh, I've heard opinions from cardiologists, but I think it's a completely different story when you're looking at, a, at an athlete. Uh, it's a very difficult, these rhythm things are very difficult. They, you know, this, this thing is one swallow doesn't make a spring. Yeah. <clears throat> so you give person one attack, but if the second one's a fatal, then God, you mm -hmm. see, you're in this terrible situation. What, did, what should we learn from Jim Fix? Oh, well, I learned from Jim Fix tremendous amount because uh, the day after he died I was on the McNeil Lair show and I hadn't a clue to why he died. I was of the same mind with Ken Cooper and many of those who were in the field that um, running simply cleansed your arteries and you were going to die of something else and what I discovered from Jim Fix is there's a difference between being fit and being healthy. What's the difference? Well, the difference is that uh, being fit is a physical rehabilitation. It has to do with these terrible muscles that you right. have. Being healthy has to do with your metabolism, yeah. and most specifically your fat metabolism, cholesterol, blood pressure, diabetes. And when there, it's quite possible to be running 50 miles a week, as Jim was, and be unhealthy. Thanks. Good to have you. George Sheehan, Dr. George Sheehan. The book is called Personal Best, if you'd like more of an understanding and an insight into his own philosophy of living, that's it. Night Watch continues back in a moment.